Uh, I'm Rory Little. I teach uh, constitutional law, criminal law, things here. And I am here to introduce our panel, uh, the title of which, in case you didn't know, is Justice Kennedy's Overall Impact. So this should only take a few minutes. Um, and so let me introduce our panelists. We're going to do what the other panels have done pretty much, which is talk for a short time each, and then uh, talk a little bit maybe among ourselves and have some questions. And we realize that we are standing between you and a reception start, that will not start until 5. Um, so whether we're fast or slow, it doesn't start till 5. Um, so let me first introduce Judge Marsha Burzon, who is seated here in the middle of the table. Um, Marsha Burzon has been a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Ninth Circuit for almost 19 years. She's a graduate of Radcliffe College at Harvard and the UC Law School that is across the bay. He shall, who shall not be named. Uh, after law school, uh, Judge Burzon served as the law clerk to the future chief judge of the Ninth Circuit, James Browning, for whom the Ninth Circuit's courthouse is named, due in large part to Judge Burzon's efforts. And she then served as the first female law clerk to the United States Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan, Jr. Um, together with her husband, Stephen, Judge Burzon had a stellar two decades in private practice at the Altshuler and Burzon, I'm shortening the name, Altshuler and Burzon Law Firm here in San Francisco. And among other notable successes, she argued in front of the Supreme Court once or more than once? More than once, that's what I thought. And, and by the way, uh, our uh, great symposium editor, Nina Gliazzo, is going to be clerking for Judge Burzon next year. And perhaps as, uh, most importantly for us, she also uh, teaches at UC Hastings, um, together with uh, Supreme Court Justice Joe Groden, who I think was here this morning but may not be here now. Um, and she has long been a friend of Hastings, so we're very grateful that she is here with us today. Okay. Uh, next to her is uh, Professor Dan Epps. Dan Epps teaches at the University, uh, the Washington University Law School in St. Louis. It has always taken me years to figure out that the Washington University is in St. Louis, Missouri, where the wind chill temperature yesterday was eight degrees. Um, he's a graduate of Harvard Law School uh, and has been a Clemenco teaching fellow there, has also taught at the University of Virginia uh, Law School while he was working in private practice for three years. Um, he also clerked at the federal appeals and Supreme Court level. He served as the law clerk to Judge Harvey Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals, and then Justice Kennedy at the Supreme Court. Uh, but of course, to many of you, Dan Epps is most well known as the founding co-host of the nationally prominent Supreme Court podcast, First Mondays, which is undoubtedly the best source of inside baseball knowledge about the Supreme Court. Uh, Leah Littman, who was on the previous panel, is uh, currently the other co-host of that uh, program. Uh, you should give it a listen. Most importantly, you should give it a listen on Monday because the four of us recorded an episode of First Mondays that I believe is going to be loaded up on Monday. Uh, in Judge Burzon's chambers, by the way. So it was a great experience. Uh, on the far left is uh, our own UC Hastings professor, Zachary Price, who also clerked for Justice Kennedy at Supreme Court. He clerked for a district court judge in Maryland first. Uh, and then for David, to, uh, Judge David Tatel on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He's a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Law School. Um, his scholarship about constitutional theory and executive branch power is remarkably relevant today. Uh, and he also worked for three years in the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, which is also a very relevant experience for today. And I think when you hear his paper that he's going to deliver you today, you will see how relevant it really is. Um, so let's start with the substance of the panel. We'll start with Judge Burzon. I'm then going to offer a few thoughts on Justice Kennedy and the criminal side of his judicial uh, career. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Professor Epps. And we will close with uh, Zach Price and then perhaps have some questions. And with that, Marsha, you can stay seated or you can stand here, whatever I'd your preference. I'd rather stay seated, yeah. if I may. I 
as a comment on the last, end of the last panel, I only heard the end of it, I didn't hear the fireworks, if there were any, but I, in preparation for this panel, I went and watched a tape of a interview with Justice Kennedy that I participated in at a Ninth Circuit conference five years ago, more than that, maybe seven years ago. Uh, and he made a comment and an observation that I think is somewhat pertinent to the end of the conversation. He said, you know, I was in high school when Brown versus the Board of Education came out. And I thought, I said to myself, oh, that's the end of prejudice and bias and, um, and uh, we can now go on. And he, and he said, and I thought to myself, and my sister knows this because she will either be a secretary or a nurse. And, and what he meant to be saying was he didn't see that discrimination at the time. And then his next sentence was, and the hardest thing to understand is the present. So I, I, I tend to be somewhat empathetic with the fact that people you know, grow up in the context that they grow up and that the stronger people can at least sense that they're not seeing everything and that things are changing. And I think that kind of comment um, and, and, and suggests that there, there is a problem sometimes with what's seeing what's around you when you've grown up um, in a closed box in which whatever that is was not visible uh, and the ability to perceive it at least retrospectively or to sense what's coming next uh, is a strength. And in, to, to sort of build on that theme, what I want to do today is a little odd because it's sort of archaeology, and that is to look at some of Justice Brennan, Justice Brennan's, Justice Kennedy's Ninth Circuit opinions and to see uh, the degree to which they either presage or don't presage uh, what he did on the Supreme Court and to, what, see, uh, to, to draw a few lessons or theories or suggestions about these kinds of trajectories, how people grow through time or how they continue to reiterate what they've done the first time. Um, and, and the second thing, if I get to it, uh, is a brief comment on a case that I'm sure no one has mentioned uh, of Justice Kennedy's called Martinez versus Ryan, but with which um, federal judges are spending an inordinate amount of time right now having to do with uh, when federal prisoners can bring habeas cases regarding ineffective assistance of counsel. And I, this month, and it's on my mind because I did three capital appeals this month, and all we did was deal with what did Justice Kennedy mean in Martinez versus Ryan. But it was also a, a fairly creative opinion and one that I think also says something about uh, what his priorities were. So uh, Justice Kennedy, uh, the name of this, this um, symposium is Justice Kennedy's influence for 40 years on the bench, but in fact, eight of those years were on the Ninth Circuit. 32 of them were on the Supreme Court. There are obvious differences in role between um, Court of Appeals judges and Supreme Court justices. The mix of cases is very different. The ability to concentrate on the important ones is somewhat different. Uh, the public attention is obviously inordinately different. Um, and the ultimate direct impact on national legal doctrine is perhaps different, although as I'm going to suggest, the indirect imp impact, i.e. what is written in a Court of Appeals opinions later shows up in Supreme Court opinions and does become um, more the law of the land. Um, we decide, but the vast majority of the cases without the Supreme Court, and we're entrusted with developing legal doctrine, uh, unless and until the Supreme Court steps in. So this is the world in which Justice Kennedy was operating for eight years. He, uh, I did not overlap with him in the court, by the way, either as a law clerk. He came right after I finished clerking or as a judge. Uh, I did get to know him somewhat later um, through Ninth Circuit conferences, primarily. So the first case I was going to talk about is um, a little peculiar. United States versus Finch decided in 1976, which was right after he got on the Ninth Circuit. And <laughs> Uh, what he, the case held that there was no double jeopardy in an instance in which the defendant entered into stipulated facts, uh, 
and the district court made a legal decision and the government appealed. And the theory was that since uh, it was simply a legal decision, the, the government could appeal. What's interesting to me about this case, uh, and probably was not terribly um, pleasing to him, uh, was that he was summarily reversed by the Supreme Court uh, without an argument um, in a one paragraph disposition very soon thereafter. Um, it must have been discouraging a bit to a new judge to, to do that. But to me, what's interesting about it is that this practice of summary reversals without argument has become fairly usual in the current court. Uh, there are six or seven or eight of them a year, maybe more. I wrote an opinion once, actually, railing about how it's a very bad idea because there isn't complete briefing. The briefing on cert petitions is decidedly not about the merits, uh, and the court tends to decide things without knowing very much, and it may be that Justice Kennedy felt that way at the time, but it may also be that <laughs> the fact that he purchased has, to my mind, as far as I know, participated in these summary reversals without ever complaining about them uh, may have been because he was a victim at the outset. Um, the other part that's interesting about this, about Finch, is that the rest of the opinion, because he decided there wasn't je double jeopardy and the case was appealable, was a lengthy historical analysis about fishing rights on the Crow Reservation. And of course, that opinion was vacated and so has never been controlling. But I did read one comment by an Indian rights litigator who said that it was, had that opinion stood, Justice Kennedy would have been known as one of the great champions um, of Indian treating, treating rights. Uh, as it turned out, the Supreme Court later um, in Montana versus United States uh, took a contrary view. And interestingly, just at the end of his tenure, Justice Kennedy recused in the United States versus Washington because digging back, he discovered uh, that in an earlier version of that case, which was also about Indian fishing rights, he had been on the case in the Ninth Circuit. So these cases, uh, some of them never go away. Um, and some of the work that we do uh, ends up uh, not having the influence it might because of fortuitous things like the fact that there was no jurisdiction in the case, according to the Supreme Court. Um, the next case I was going to mention was from 1979, Spain versus Pecunia. This was a very well-known case in California. Um, Justice Kennedy began the opinion by saying that this case is difficult because it requires us to pass upon measures adopted by prison officers for the safe custody of some of the most dangerous men in the prison population. Uh, there was, as you may remember, but probably don't, uh, a great deal of uh, unrest in the California prison population during prison system during that time um, and the politicalization of the system. Uh, and the, with res result to Johnny Spade and some other um, prisoners, um, they were placed in solitary confinement. They were shackled severely um, everywhere they went. They were routinely had chair gas used on them. Uh, they had no outdoor exercise and so on. So this was an early Eighth Amendment case and to my mind ties in uh, quite directly um, with Justice Kennedy's later um, interest in prison conditions and the opinions in Brown versus Plata concerning the California prison system, and his quite extraordinary, I think, concurrence in Davis versus Ayala, which is another case that we spend a lot of time on with regard to the procedural issues, but he wrote a somewhat out of the box and not in the case concurrence, just about solitary confinement and how it was really important that this be looked at and considered and kind of inviting litigation on solitary confinement. Um, Spain versus Procuniae seems to me clearly to be the incubus for the set of concerns. He began with, uh, he, he, he says in it that underlying the Eighth Amendment is a fundamental premise that prisoners are not to be treated as less than human beings. And I, I think that refrain kind of ties into some of what we've been talking about earlier, uh, which is you know, somewhere at the core of his jurisprudence and perhaps his just worldview is 
this, the sense of everyone's humanity, whatever else one may, whatever, whatever the, the opposing balance of rights is. And in this instance, he was very aware that the court's adjustment must be informed by current enlightened scientific opinions as to the conditions necessary to ensure good physical and mental health for prisoners. I think that's another afraid, I, an interest and expertise in what um, non-lawyers and non-judges are saying about things. Um, so he, the opinion is a very careful exegesis going through uh, each of the restraints and approving some of them and disapproving others um, in a way that was probably fairly unusual at the time given the fairly, very high profile um, fear of, of these particular people and of California prisoners in general. Um, Okay, then we have Flores, I'm, I'm, this is fairly chronological. Flores versus Pierce. This case, was fa I've never heard of it, and it was really interesting to read. It was a denial of business restaurant licenses in Calistoga in the wine country to two businesses, one owned by a Hispanic and one not by a Hispanic, but both with largely Hispanic clientele. Um, and in both instances, the um, local police and had protested the issuance of business licenses to these individuals to run restaurants and bars. And the case was decided after Washington versus Davis and Arlington Heights, so a, a straight disparate impact equal protection theory was not available. And it is a, a, a quite careful and interesting approach to how one finds intent, again we're back to an animus theory, but intent, um, emphasizing that the fact that these were the only two licenses that had been protested uh, was critically important, i.e. that the disparate impact was of enormous relevance even if not controlling. Um, and also that there was some deviation from procedure, but I also thought in light of um, Masterpiece Cake that he all saw in a evidence of pretext or animus in the statements that the concerns were with the desirability of the applicant and keeping the town at a good level. Um, he read into those statements uh, quite properly, it seems to me, uh, the notion that the um, race or ethnicity of the applicants was relevant. And I mean, Masterpiece case, Cake, for whatever else one thinks of it, um, is you know, a kind of odd um, attribution of motive from the statements of legislators somewhere, or in that case it was adjudicators, somewhere up the line of authority uh, as to why they were acting the way they were acting. I also wondered a bit uh, how this dovetailed with the Trump travel ban case, which I gather was discussed somewhat earlier in the sense that um, that sensitivity to motive uh, wasn't there, but it, or, or, or at least, but it, one suspects that the immigration context and may, may have been controlling in, in, in the Trump case. Then really fascinating was Beller versus Middendorf. We're still in 1980. This was a case in which Justice, Brennan, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion which upheld a Navy, the Navy's policy precluding gays from serving in the Navy. Um, Matt Coles told me at lunch today that uh, despite that holding, and I'm going to tell you why, it was regarded as actually a somewhat hopeful opinion, and in fact it was. I think it does have the um, pieces or the um, you know, glimmers of Justice Kennedy's later um, views in, in, in Romer and Lawrence <coughs> and Windsor and Obergefell. Um, with regard to um, LBGT rights. So he began, he began actually with, we recognize that to many persons, the regulations may seem unwise. 
presumably at that time in 1980, he, many people, it didn't seem so unwise, but that is where he started. Um, and he spent a lot of time in the opinion on limits of the judicial role, as, as to which, at least from my reading of this set of opinions, he sort of ran hat and cold. Sometimes he was very concerned with the limits of the judicial role, and at other times, as I will explain it a minute, he was very uh, concerned with the importance of the judicial role to step in when there's political stalemate or um, other um, incru in incru incursions on the judiciary. And he also said in this opinion, which resulted in upholding the Navy's policies, that we can concede that the reasons which led the court to protect certain private decisions intimately linked with one's personality, citing Rome and Griswold and others, suggest, uh, and family living arrangements beyond the core nuclear family suggest that some kinds of government regulation of private consensual homosexual behavior may face substantial constitutional challenge. And then he went on to say that here the state does not seek to use criminal processes to coerce persons to comply with a moral precept even if they are consenting adults, i.e. the Lawrence case. Um, so the seeds are all sitting here even though in the end, he says, this is the military and essentially because it's the military, largely we are going to accede to its um, policies. He, but this is another place where the fact that it's hard to see the present um, comes back because he says the Navy's concerns have a basic in fact. What were the concerns? They were articulated as tensions and hostilities because the great majority of naval personnel despise to detest homosexuality and that it's going to create problems. And also that there's going to be an impact on recruiting because parents will become concerned about their children associated with individuals who are incapable of maintaining high moral standards. Uh, and in the course of so this opinion says that these concerns have a basis in, in fact, but then goes back again and says, upholding the challenge regulations is distinct from a statement that they are wise. It should be plain from our opinion that the constitutionality of regulation stems from the needs of the military. So this looks like the beginning of an internal struggle within him uh, with the issues and with the applicable doctrines. He has a discussion of the levels of, of scrutiny that are applicable to um, this kind of discrimination. Uh, and it's also, it seems to me, to be a forerunner of the recurring tension in Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence between, the codes be, between concerns with upholding personal liberty and concerns with preserving the role of the court versus other governmental institutions. I have time for a couple more? A couple more. Okay. <laughs> uh, I only have a couple more. Um, Chadha. Now, this was fascinating to read. Chadha, as you may remember, was the Supreme Court, became the Supreme Court opinion. Uh, in which Chief Justice Berger wrote uh, over only one dissent by Justice White that a, the policy, the, there was a statute at the time that provided that whenever the Justice Department through the immigration courts, which were much more primitive at the time, provided exceptions to deportation for hardship, E, the, the, the opinion or the ruling had to be sent to Congress and either um, House could veto it. So it was a unicameral, non-president involved, congressional decision in reversing what was essentially an adjudication. The Supreme Court opinion by Chief Justice Berger focuses exclusively on the bicameralism, the, the interference with bicameralism and with the role of the president. But Justice Kennedy's opinion is really quite remarkable. I, I thought much more interesting uh, than Justice Berger's because it 
is a lengthy exegesis on the role of the separation of powers. He cites Madison, Jefferson, Adams, Montesquieu, and everybody else you can think of. Uh, long quotes from the um, Federalist Papers. Uh, and he stresses both the goal of preventing the undue concentration power because of the danger to liberty, which is liberty, which became a recurring Kennedy theme um, with regard to federalism and, sep and separation of powers within the federal government. Uh, and also, and this was fascinating to me, that the, the need to avoid a stalemate and the judiciary as the mechanism of avoiding stalemates. So in other words, um, he said, well, one possibility, of course, is to tell the executive to go stop the Congress from doing this, but that's not what we do. We have these questions of separation of powers go to the judiciary, uh, and the judiciary decides them. So what's notable is the ambition of the opinion, and it read like me, to me, like an application to be a Supreme Court justice, frankly. <laughs> and the fact that the Supreme Court affirms was so much more modest, uh, and even though it was accused by the dissent of being too expansive. So where are the echoes of this in the Supreme Court jurisprudence? I was thinking maybe Bush versus Gore in the sense of the, this notion that the judiciary sometimes just has to take over. Uh, that there is, uh, you know, I, that I think seems to me to be questionable, but that, that really, that at some point we have no choice but to step in to the political system because that's really what he was saying in large part in Chata. And then the last case I was going to mention, because it's a free exercise clause case, which I think does show where free exercise and establishment clause law has moved in Justice Kennedy with it, uh, was Graham, Ber Graham versus the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Several members of the Church of Scientology challenged on the basis of the free exercise and um, establishment the refusal of the IRS to give them charitable deductions for the way in which they interact, they provided money to the Church of Scientology, which was through these auditing costs, which were not voluntary or, or were transactions, i.e. there was a quid pro quo, um, and to the, INS that, the IRS that was not a, a charitable contribution. Uh, they insisted that this doctrine of ex exchange, that they needed to get something in exchange, um, was part of their religion. And Justice Kennedy's opinion at first takes issue with that and says, well, he didn't think there was any prohibition on them actually giving donations. But aside from that, he said, even if what they're saying is right, the government interest in a neutral and enforceable taxation system is compelling, and it outweighs the burden on religious beliefs and he stresses the cost of creating exemptions for taxes. It seems to me to take a much narrower view of the free exercise clause than, for example, Hobby Lobby did more recently, um, suggesting um, a shift regarding the preeminence of religious objectors' interests. And, and that, I think, is a shift that's come with the ascendance, the, the society ascendance of um, um, evangelical religion and so on. So that is my archaeology. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was Martinez versus Ryan. Martinez is an opinion which was something of a tour de force. The prior law had held that there is no constitutional right to representation by counsel in state post-conviction review proceedings, or federal post-conviction review proceedings for that matter. And because there was no such constitutional right, um, the ineffectiveness of a lawyer in post-conviction review proceedings was not a ground for excusing a procedural default. In other words, if the um, state, I'm going to use the term PCR, post-conviction review, lawyer doesn't raise an issue 
that is a procedural default and the um, petitioner, the, the prisoner, cannot raise it on habeas, on federal habeas. And when Martinez versus Ryan was argued in the Supreme Court, the lawyers were, were accepting this framework, but arguing that there was some limited right, constitutional right, to lawyers uh, in state PCR proceedings where they, it was the first time that you could raise ineffective assistance in the trial court. I know this is all very complicated. Uh, it's the complication of it which has made it so difficult to work with this opinion. Um, so, but what struck me as, as so interesting is that Justice Kennedy's opinion just walks away from the framework. And it basically says, we're not deciding that there is a state, a right to state, to constitutional right to lawyers in, in post-conviction review proceedings. We're just saying as an equitable matter that you at least get one shot at an ineffective assistance claim regarding your trial. And so it's not a procedural default for federal habeas purposes, but you don't have a right to have that lawyer. Um, and as I say, it didn't, I, I, whether he dreamed this up or whether, uh, where exactly it came from, I don't know. I read the, um, the argument the other day and it really wasn't being presented that way at all. The opinion has proved, it, it comes up, he completely underestimates in the opinion how often and how much this is going to impact the um, litigation of capital cases because it basically comes up before us in every capital habeas case we have. Uh, and it is uh, very hard to work with because I think because it was sort of made up out of Oak Law, the details don't spin out very well. But at the same time, I do think it's important that, first of all, as someone said to me yesterday, Justice Kennedy uh, wasn't very enamored of, of procedural technicalities. So the notion that at least these people should be heard in court did seem important enough to him to start manipulating the doctrine. Uh, and secondly, that at the bottom of this is the importance of, of lawyers, um, <coughs> that you have to at least have one shot at a competent lawyer um, and I, I think that theme is one that recurs as well. So that is what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Judge Berzon. I'm going to try to give you a few thoughts about criminal cases um, in kind of a very rapid-fire way rather than sticking to some prepared text. Um, so uh, Justice Kennedy, uh, let's just start with this, was appointed in 1975 to the Ninth Circuit um, by um, a short-time president, Gerald Ford, who appointed another, uh, he was appointed to the Ninth Circuit, uh, he, Gerald Ford appointed somebody to the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Stevens, another middle of the rotor, shall we call him. Um, and remember, he was appointed after um, very divisive hearings on uh, Judge Robert Bork, who was not confirmed. Uh, so I think he was perceived as a, a moderate, in some sense, who would calm the partisan waters. He was confirmed unanimously, 97 to nothing. Um, what I want to do in these quick remarks is give you one lesson for lawyers and law students, and then very quickly four themes. Here's the lesson. Um, the first thing I wanted to do uh, in evaluating the 43 years of judicial work that Justice Kennedy produced in the criminal field, I'm limiting my looking to the criminal field, was to just figure out how many opinions he'd written. Um, and so uh, my, I will not recount for you the hours of frustration that my law student research assistant suffered, and then I suffered, and then Chuck Marcus in our library suffered, trying to figure this out. The electronic databases are not something you should rely on. You law students, stop it. There is no substitute for hard work. Um, so just to, just to give you a taste of this, um, it was easy enough to figure out what opinions he had written, although even, even that was uh, 
had errors in it because they would include dissents from certiorari or stay orders in chambers and things like that. Uh, but w after you establish the total number of opinions and then you tried to limit it to criminal law and procedure, um, I found a 15 percent error rate in classification by uh, the faceless Westlaw workers or, or uh, Westlaw was ne Lexis Nexus was a little better than Westlaw. Let's just say that. Um, he wrote about 900 opinions. He wrote about 900 opinions in 43 years. That's a lot of writing. I haven't read them all. Uh, but I will say this. After I went through a list of about 126 uh, Supreme Court opinions limited to criminal law and procedure, I found that at least 21 of them were mischaracterized um, because they included tax cases and abortion cases and um, labor law cases. <laughs> religious freedom cases, these are all under criminal law and procedure. I mean, uh, so don't rely on the electronic research is the uh, bottom line. After going through these cases one by one, I will tell you that out of the 900, um, 438 cases on the Ninth Circuit, 464 on the Supreme Court, about 350 might have been uh, filtered for criminal subject matter. And I use a broad definition including immigration, uh, civil cases that involve criminal law, uh, underlayment, uh, such as immunity cases, qualified immunity cases. Um, and it's, it's an imperfect number uh, that I have. And so what I'm going to tell you now in my themes is based on these numbers, which I think I'm confident on the Supreme Court. I haven't yet gone through the Ninth Circuit in that detail. Um, so here's my, here's my themes. The first one might surprise some of you. Um, after you go through the 212 majority opinions that he wrote in, on the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, in 30 years, uh, in criminal law and procedure cases, it turns out the majority, it's not an overwhelming majority, but the majority were rulings for the defendant, not for the government. That um, when, uh, I'm not sure whether this reflects the fact that when he is assigned, he is more likely to rule for the defendant than when he's just voting. Maybe he votes in a more conservative direction, but when he's actually writing, not. Or, or whether it was just where, where the five justice majorities fell, uh, although they were not all five to four. Many were unanimous. Um, but the idea that he uh, it was conservatively always in favor of the government, I think, is wrong. Um, but the second thing I'll say about this is that um, Justice Kennedy, uh, as you have heard in other panels, had a central motivating theme in a lot of his cases, uh, which was called liberty. There are two books written about uh, Justice uh, Kennedy. Both were published originally in 2009, so they're not quite up to date. One is called, um, uh, let's see, uh, this is by Frank Colucci, Justice Kennedy's Jurisprudence, The Full and Necessary Meaning of Liberty. The other is by a woman named Helen Knowles, The Tie Goes to Freedom, Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, and Liberty. So they both detect this theme. Other themes have been noted, such as dignity and equality. Uh, Judge Feinerman actually has published a, a reminiscence, of, at least in the Stanford Law Review, uh, which is in, uh, includes the concept of dignity uh, for Justice Kennedy. Um, what I'm going to say is that this concept of liberty, which has this expansive reach in the cases you've heard about, uh, some of the same-sex marriage cases, some of his death penalty cases, is tempered in other criminal contexts by a balancing that he does with certain law enforcement interests. And here's a quote that I, I will read to you. Well, first, let me read to you something from Obergefell. Obergefell, the same-sex marriage um, decision. He, here's what he says. The Constitution promises a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. I think that within a lawful realm, set off by commas, might have been inserted. Uh, who knows, even by a law clerk who was here today. Uh, who knows? Uh, because I think he, he cares more about liberty in the lawful realm than when you are in the unlawful realm uh, of criminal law. Um, here's what he said in a case called Weaver, a 2017 case, which involved um, a criminal trial where Weaver, who was 16 years old, was being tried for murder uh, and as an adult, and his 
family and the public were excluded from the courtroom in Massachusetts because the courtroom was too small to accommodate the jury pool. So the marshals just decided, well, we'll let enough jurors in to get the jury selected, and after that's over, we'll let the public in. Um, and this was before there was a constitutional ruling that jury selection must be open to the public. But nobody objected. Nobody objected. So Weaver brought this claim not on direct appeal. He didn't object at the time. He didn't object uh, on appeal, but in a collateral attack. And here's what Justice uh, Kennedy said, resolving this case against Weaver's claim. He says, in the criminal justice system, the constant, indeed unending duty of the judiciary is to seek and to find the proper balance between the necessity for fair and just trials and the importance of finality <coughs> of judgments. So this balancing of criminal justice finality together with this ideal of liberty, I think, is, can be seen through as a theme through a lot of his decisions. Uh, and I will say that I also believe that when cases were up on habeas, which is a collateral attack, not a direct appeal context, uh, he's much more likely to rule for the government in a criminal case than, than, than in a direct appeal uh, or than in a civil case, let's say. Um, so that's my third point, is that he, there's a difference in how he evaluates criminal habeas cases, which is interesting because so many cases come to the court on a habeas context, uh, often do, to the ineffective assistance of counsel, which is what makes this Martinez case that Judge Berzon uh, mentioned so relevant. Um, and the fourth thing I'm just going to say is consistency and impact. Uh, I detect a fair amount of consistency in his cases, at least in the criminal context. I don't believe he wavered from side to side. I do believe he took each case as it came. And I think I, that was actually one of his great uh, talents. Uh, people have remarked on this, but the idea that he actually evaluated each case as it came to him and did not have a ideological presumption that every case in this area must come out this way um, made it, I think, refreshing for lawyers sometimes to be arguing in front of them. Um, but he, he was consistent and he had a lot of impact on criminal law and I think we're going to hear about this later, as, uh, later meaning over time as people evaluate further what he had to say in more precise uh, areas and not just same-sex marriage cases or death penalty cases where he has a remarkably strong impact uh, in limiting capital punishment in, in, this, in this, not eliminating it, but limiting it to various categories. Um, and so I'm just going to say one thing about one case called uh, Jewell, United States versus Jewell. United States versus Jewell was one of the first cases he heard. Uh, it was decided by the Ninth Circuit in 1976, uh, and he dissented. It was the very first dissent he wrote, as far as I know, on the Ninth Circuit. He'd been on the court for, I think, less than a year at that point. Um, this is a case involving a concept called willful blindness. If you've taken my criminal law class, you know what that's about. Uh, otherwise, you may not. Um, but I will say this, the majority in this case adopted the idea that willful blindness is a way of proving knowledge. Did you know the marijuana was in the trunk? The person says, well, no, because I never looked. The majority says, well, when the, the circumstances are suspicious, we might use a concept of willful blindness, which goes way back to common law uh, as, a, as a definition of knowledge. Justice Kennedy dissents because he says, you know, you've got to limit this concept in a very careful way so that willful blindness doesn't become uh, negligence. Uh, when, when a statute requires knowledge, you've got to prove knowledge. Uh, and this might be used as a definition for knowledge, but it can't be watered down. So he says, you know, jury instructions have to say two other things in addition to the sort of general concept. I won't go into the details. But what I will say is that I believe what he said in that dissent has become the law uh, in every jurisdiction in the country that uses the concept of willful blindness. Um, and I say that it's a mark of his consistency because in 2011, 2011 is 36 years later from Jewell, they have a patent case uh, where the court holds that knowledge is required to demonstrate, uh, I, I can't remember the phrase, willful infringement of a patent. Uh, it's not a case I would ever read. Uh, <laughs> If it, unless it had to do with willful blindness. And the, the majority seems to say, we think the facts here are sufficient to show willful blindness in this patent infringer's uh, factual scenario. It's eight to one. I haven't studied all of his opinions, but I think this may be his only dissent in an eight to one case on the Supreme Court. He's the only dissenter. And what does he say? 
He says exactly what he said in Jewell to the majority. And Jewell, by the way, was on bonk. He was saying it to an on bonk majority, uh, meaning, you know, 11 judges. He says, look, you guys are right that willful <coughs> blindness should be uh, a definition of knowledge, but you haven't been careful in how you apply it. You have to apply it in the following detailed way. And he says effectively what he said to Jewell. Um, and so what I will say is that um, in his criminal cases, his liberty interest is tempered, I think, by other balances, particularly in the habeas con uh, concept. Um, I, I exclude death penalty cases because he clearly had a different view of dignity and liberty, a very expansive view in the death penalty con context, and that he was consistent and his criminal cases were impactful. Uh, and uh, I have, I, I clerked for Justice Brennan, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I wasn't clerking when Justice Kennedy was there at the Supreme Court, but certainly I viewed Justice Kennedy as a more conservative judge. Um, but I will say that my review of his criminal cases suggests that I need to a little bit rethink my view of how conservative he really was, because many of his cases, particularly death penalty cases, he comes out on the side of the defendant. And with that, that wasn't that long, was it? Let's see. <laughs> no. That was a, well, that was longer than it should have been. Um, we will turn it over to Professor Epps. Um, so thanks, Rory, and the editors of the Hastings Law Journal for hosting me. Um, and thanks to all of my co-panelists for appearing on First Mondays, on this Monday's episode. Uh, I encourage everyone to listen to it, if only for the reason that you'll get to hear me very confidently correct Rory on a point of law on which I am clearly and verifiably wrong. Uh, and Roy, I could tell you're such a nice guy because you didn't, you just said, oh, you must be right uh, and let me get away with that. Um, so uh, you'll enjoy that. Um, this panel, uh, I've been asked to talk about Justice Kennedy's overall impact. Justice Kennedy's impact on American law was large. And I'll stop there. Um, <clears throat> oh, I, I'm told I need to keep talking for a little while longer, so I'll, I'll say a bit more. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about Justice Kennedy's impact in general, uh, but I want to just start by actually talking about his impact on my own life, uh, and I'm going to expand out a little bit in a second. And, you know, I remember getting the call from him uh, offering me a clerkship as really, you know, unquestionably the most important day in my professional life. The job of clerking for him uh, was just really wonderful. Uh, we got to work on the biggest cases. We didn't really have to waste time with dissents very often. Uh, and he really cared what we thought. He wanted us to sit around the table and just debate first principles with him. Um, and being able to do that, and being asked to do that, barely a year out of law school uh, was really quite a, as surreal as it sounds. Um, and there were just many moments where I was sitting there, I said, is this really happening? This just makes no sense. Uh, and he really was the best boss I ever had. I think Justice Kennedy uh, recognized that he really had the best job uh, in the country. And I struggle to think of instances where he got mad or upset about anything, even when uh, particularly vituperative dissents uh, from one justice in particular would come across his desk. Uh, he just wouldn't be bothered by them. I could only think of even one example, I spent a long time trying to think about this, where he expressed any disapproval of my work in any way. And this is, it's so trivial, I just want to tell you about it. Um, one of our jobs was to prepare bench memos in these binders for him, and they would, the binders would also include key cases and statutes and things like that. And so I, as this enterprising young law clerk who wanted to protect the environment and protect the public fisc, I just unilaterally decided, I'm going to start printing these on double-sided paper without checking with the justice. <laughs> and um, one day, we were all, all, all of those clerks were sitting in his chambers, and he was just sort of thumbing through one, and he sort of looked over at me quizzically, and he said, oh, are we doing this now? Uh, and for any other judge, that would be the equivalent of being screamed at. And I got the message and stopped doing that. Um, in fact, clerking for Justice Kennedy uh, was such a great experience that for years afterwards, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, I, I would actually have dreams in which he called me up and said, Dan, I need you to come back. Uh, and I would wake up genuinely sad that that is just not a thing that one gets to do in life. Um, Luckily, those dreams largely stopped once I became a law professor and stopped working at a big law firm, uh, but still. You know, probably the biggest impact, though, uh, was on my career after leaving. I, I can't think of the number of opportunities I've had in my career um, that I've had because I just had the dumb luck to be selected as a law clerk. 
it really changed the whole course of my career. And one thing that I'm really gonna miss now that he's retired is during those eight years between when I'd left and when he was still in the court, uh, people would always want me to tell them how he was gonna vote in big cases. And when I was asked about this, I'd reflect on all the inside information I'd learned about his decision-making process, and I'd lean in and say, I have no idea. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna miss that. And, and in thinking, though, about the impact that Justice Kennedy had on, on my life, I am really struck by all the kind of random events that went into that, all the luck, all the coincidences, the right people making the phone calls at the right time, and I just happened to luck out uh, and have this event that happened that really changed the course of my life when all these equally or more deserving people didn't get that opportunity. And that lets me think, it leads me to thinking about Justice Kennedy's career and how uh, some really random, unpredictable events played a pretty big role in him being on the Supreme Court. We've heard about some of that already today. Uh, he wasn't President Reagan's first nominee. That was Robert Bork, who was rejected by the Senate. He wasn't the second nominee. That was Douglas, Douglas Ginsburg, who had to withdraw after reports about his marijuana usage came to light. And President Reagan needed then to nominate someone who was certain of confirmation, and he went to then Judge Kennedy, uh, who had had the good luck to have been one of Governor Reagan's lawyers back in Sacramento. And I think uh, you can imagine, uh, as a lot of Republicans uh, probably have over the years, alternate universes uh, in which things work out a little differently. Maybe President Reagan uh, nominates Bork in 1986 when the Republicans still have the Senate, uh, and then in 1988, uh, he nominates Antonin Scalia, who in 86 was confirmed unanimously uh, for the seat that's vacated by Justice Powell and that Justice Kennedy in our reality actually sits in. And if that happens, uh, the shape of American constitutional law uh, over the last few decades would look quite different. Justice Kennedy wouldn't have written any of the important opinions that he ended up writing, and that's a very long list. Uh, that no doubt includes some of your favorite and some of your least favorite outcomes the Supreme Court has reached, regardless of your political ide ideology. Now, not all of those cases would have come out differently if someone other than Justice Kennedy had ended up on the court in 1988, but a number of them very well could have. Uh, Roe versus Wade might not have been upheld in Casey. Sodomy laws uh, might not have been declared unconstitutional in Lawrence. Gay marriage might not have been held to be constitutionally required in Obergefell. And I think just thinking about some of those cases should give you a sense of Justice Kennedy's tremendous influence uh, on American law. Now, I think there's some obvious rejoinders to this. You know, a lot of people say, well, the swing justice writes a bunch of important decisions, but doesn't end up being that influential because they reach compromises that aren't durable over time. And they point to Justice Powell and Justice O'Connor uh, as examples of people who are very influential while they're in the court uh, but then are less so going forward. And, you know, I think that there's reason that this new Supreme Court could end up rejecting some of Justice Kennedy's positions in particular cases, but not certainly not all of them, and certainly uh, could refuse to extend some of his decisions further. But I, I think that's kind of beside the point, because I think that whatever happens to his decisions, uh, Justice Kennedy had uh, a really Im big impact. Uh, his decisions had a big impact on American law and American history, regardless of what happens. And it sort of brings me back to my theme of random events having a big impact. So because of this series of random events, we end up with Justice Kennedy on the court, and he ends up advancing his own somewhat idiosyncratic vision uh, of constitutional law. Now, in terms of that vision, you've already heard a lot about his views of the importance of liberty and dignity. I'm not going to say more about that, but I want to draw attention to a slightly different theme that I see in his opinions. Uh, it's the idea of the court as a teacher for the nation. Uh, in 1952, Eugene Rastow described the justices as teachers in a vital national seminar. And I see this vision echoed in a lot of Justice Kennedy's decisions and how he talks about the court. To give a couple examples, in Obergefell, he says that the court needed to act then because were the court to uphold the challenge laws as constitutional, it would teach the nation that these laws are in accord with our society's most basic compact. And in the joint dissent uh, in NFIB versus Sibelius, uh, the decision uh, challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, in language that I would put money on being written by Justice Kennedy, the dissent says, it should be the responsibility of the court to teach otherwise to remind our people that the framers considered structural protections of freedom the most important ones. 
for which reason they, they alone were embodied in the original Constitution, not left to later amendment. The fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty, and when we destroy it, we place liberty at, pay, at peril. Today's decision should have vindicated, should have taught this truth. Instead, our judgment today has disregarded it. And as someone who has chosen to spend my career teaching, uh, I'm really struck by this vision of the court as teacher. Uh, I think it explains why Justice Kennedy seemed to have such a robust vision uh, of the court's role in striking down legislation. Uh, and I find it interesting that uh, given that teaching has played a big role in his life, he's taught for many years, he taught for many years at McGeorge in Sacramento. He continues to teach uh, in the summers uh, in Europe while he's been on the court. Uh, and he also has had a very high number of former clerks who, like me, became law professors, uh, became teachers. And uh, this morning um, at breakfast, he was wondering why that's so. And I think, I think maybe one explanation is that his clerks want to have jobs that give them platforms from which they can take pot shots at his uh, decisions. And so I'm going to exercise that prerogative here very briefly. And I'll say that if the court uh, is a teacher, in a democracy, the people are very unruly students. Uh, and the cases where the court has tried to teach the people a lesson they were not ready to learn have not always gone well for the court. Uh, so, for example, in language from another joint opinion that I strongly suspect Justice Kennedy wrote, Casey says that it is the court's role to call the contending sides of a national controversy to end their national division by accepting a common mandate rooted in the Constitution. Whatever you think about the outcome in that case, I don't think anyone can say uh, that the decision ended our national division on the question uh, of abortion. Likewise, I think the court narrowly avoided a major mistake in NFIB versus Sebelius. Uh, striking down the Affordable Care Act would not, in my view, have taught the public anything, but would have greatly diminished the court's prestige and power. Um, but though I have some reservations about Justice Kennedy's view uh, of the role of judicial review, that's not really my focus here. Instead, I want to come back to my theme of random events, making it impossible for individual people to have really big impacts, as Justice Kennedy did. Uh, and I've been thinking about that a lot in the last couple years as the membership of the Supreme Court has changed. So much about this court's membership turns on these random, unpredictable, uh, unpredictable events that don't have much to do with democratic politics. Who dies when? Who gets sick when? Who decides to retire when? And those largely random events end up determining who gets control of the Supreme Court. Right now, everyone on the left is terrified about Justice Ginsburg's health. For the last few years, uh, we were all watching Justice Kennedy very closely. Those of us on the left were worried he would retire, and people on the right were hoping that he would. Uh, and his decision uh, about when to retire is going to end up shaping constitutional law for decades. And this system in which the membership of the court ends up turning on so many random events, in which single people exercise massive power for the rest of their lives, I think might have been tolerable for a big part of American history, but the system seems to be really showing uh, some strain. And I think what's changed is the rise of polarized, competing judicial philosophies that largely line up with party identification. And I think Justice Kennedy, in retrospect, is gonna be remembered as one of the last justices who came of age before thinking about law became so rigid and polarized. Uh, and that fact, I think, explains why the decision he reached were often so ideologically unpredictable. And going forward, I suspect we're not going to see more Justice Kennedys on the court. I think we're going to see a court in which voting lines up with party identification far more than it ever has. Uh, and that development, I think, raises really hard questions about our current system, uh, about who controls the court, who's on the court, who serves on the court, and who's able to have a massive impact on the law and the country more generally, and how it turns on so many random events. And I don't have time in these remarks to talk about how we might solve that problem, but I do think considering Justice Kennedy's career and the tremendous impact he had and was able to have over the course of his career uh, makes it a good time to start thinking about those questions. Okay, uh, well thank you all for staying to the bitter end here. Um, uh, and I'm delighted, it's been a wonderful conference. I'm, I'm so glad to be part of this uh, panel. Um, I should echo Dan's point. I'm also, as you know, a Kennedy clerk, and it was also a great stroke of good fortune in my life, um, for which I'm very um, indebted. Um, but uh, kind of, in some ways, picking up where Dan left off, I'm gonna use my remarks uh, to make a kind of pitch for radical moderation. <laughs> um, 
Uh, specifically, I'm going to pitch an idea I've been working on that I'm calling uh, symmetric constitutionalism. And I'll explain the connection to Justice, legacy, Justice Kennedy's legacy momentarily, uh, but my basic idea is I think in our era of intense political polarization, uh, courts should, when possible, uh, within limits I'll talk about, uh, they should favor constitutional understandings that are symmetric. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is, is understandings that protect interests on different sides of the ideological spectrum uh, simultaneously. So in other words, I think, um, particularly given the kind of appointment process we have now, I think courts have to consciously resist the tendency to frame constitutional debates in zero-sum terms as a kind of continuation of political warfare by other means. Uh, I think they should be trying instead to spread out uh, constitutional law's benefits, uh, giving both major partisan camps a stake in preserving the system and ideally encouraging partisans to uh, view each other, e each side's, sorry, encourage each side to view the other's freedoms as a reflection of their own, maybe help stabilize a, a conception of shared constitutional citizenship. So I'll talk more about this idea and, and its, its ramifications and uh, grounding, uh, but I think maybe it helps to start with some examples, uh, try and make this more concrete. So I think a great example of a symmetric doctrine uh, was sort of the theme of our first panel, uh, the First Amendment principle of content neutrality uh, for government laws regulating expression of ideas. So I think that, that doctrine is paradigmatically symmetric. Right, it's the whole point is it protects all speakers wherever you are on the ideological spectrum, uh, whatever the position they're advancing. Uh, so in any given case, right, it might have a, the a speakers, uh, the result will have a certain ideological valence, but across the universe of cases, um, it spreads out the benefit. Um, a helpful example the other way, a kind of paradigmatically asymmetric holding, I would suggest, is the Supreme Court's Second Amendment ruling in Heller versus District of Columbia. Uh, interpreting the Second Amendment to create an individual right to bear arms. Um, that holding effectively constitutionalized one ideological position in a politically fraught debate over uh, gun regulation. Now, importantly, that does not necessarily mean that Heller is wrong. Uh, symmetry isn't always going to be decisive, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but my key conjecture uh, in the paper and what I'm trying to present here is that asymmetry is costly, and I think uh, Heller does demonstrate that. It makes both the court and the constitutional law it's creating appear one-sided, right, rather than bipartisan, and that that potentially threatens the legitimacy uh, and stability of, of both constitutional law and, and judicial authority. Okay, so let me try and unpack this idea a little bit and talk about a few other examples. Um, but maybe I should start with something about the kind of motivation for the paper uh, or the, this idea, uh, which is really that, um, as Dan alluded to, I think we're, we're in an environment of increasingly intense political disagreement, uh, polarization, and that's placing a lot of stress on our constitutional system in general and on judicial authority in particular. I think you're all obviously aware of this, uh, but I'll give you a kind of grim example. I was reading a recent study reporting that something like 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats think the country would be better off if large numbers of their partisan opponents, quote, just died. <laughs> okay. so, um, uh, but, you know, as is also probably obvious to everyone here, I, I think this, this political conflict also infects constitutional law. Uh, the two parties are aligned with, are increasingly embracing kind of competing constitutional visions along key dimensions. And what's more in particular are concrete disputes uh, over immigration, say, or substantive due process, right? Outcome preferences tend to swamp more general procedural or constitutional commitments. Um, and so in terms of the theme of the conference, I think the way this connects to Justice Kennedy's legacy is that his presence on the court as this kind of idiosyncratic vote masks this problem to some degree, at least a high level of generality. Kennedy's role is to kind of dole out high profile wins and losses to each uh, major coalition, producing kind of high level symmetry uh, that might have had some stabilizing effect. Uh, but now he's gone, I think not only is he gone, but uh, the divisive Trump presidency, uh, the controversy over Kavanaugh's appointment as a successor have probably made this uh, degree of polarization over constitutional law worse. And, uh, you know, all this worries me because I'm basically an institutionalist. I think we need some kind of constitutional floor under uh, 
uh, political conflict. I think courts have an important role to play in protecting civil liberty that might be even more important uh, in an era like this than in some other periods. And I think we have to worry about that for kind of collapsing if we don't attend to the um, uh, negative partisanship and the dynamics it creates for courts. Okay, so that's the concern. Um, let me come back to my proposal. So as I said, I, the way I think courts should navigate this environment is to favor, when possible, asymmetric understandings. So in other words, holdings, rationales, doctrines that protect interests on different sides of the ideological spectrum rather than just advancing one position at others' expense. Now, to be clear with the character of this claim, I'm sort of envisioning this operating as a kind of uh, preference, or what I call an ethos, as a kind of thumb on the scale, not necessarily a primary interpretive value. I think under conventional uh, interpretive practices uh, uh, for constitutional interpretation, generally text structure, precedent are going to be controlling. There, there may not be much space left over for symmetry. Uh, but by the same token, I think it's a value that judges with differing primary commitments, different interpretive theories could equally incorporate into their approach. So a kind of analog, uh, probably the best analog, is um, uh, would be a kind of generic preference to judicial restraint, an idea generally associated with a uh, theorist a century ago uh, named James Bradley Thayer, right? So a Thayerian judge tries to interfere with democratic choices only when the Constitution is clear. Right, so um, try and favor, keep broad space for political action open that way. Uh, but the thing is, when, it, when the Constitution is clear, it might depend on more basic questions of interpretive theory, right, might be subject to disagreement. Uh, but by the same token, right, judges with different primary commitments could equally incorporate um, that as a value. Uh, and I think symmetry could have the same sort of character as a kind of value that people with different primary commitments could equally uh, incorporate. Uh, 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 to a greater or lesser extent. Um, but my argument is that uh, as compared to Thayerian restraint or some other kind of uh, general principles of this sort that people advocate, I think symmetry is actually the better value for our time, right? So if the, if the central challenge we have right now is that negative partisanship is creating risks of political overreach, selective disregard for civil liberty and constitutional restraint, uh, we don't necessarily want courts to pull back from um, a significant role enforcing constitutional limits on democratic outcomes uh, in the way a Thayerian judge might advocate. Uh, what we want is for them to seek understandings w when they can that are going to diffuse or mitigate political conflicts over constitutional law. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, in terms of what else might justify it, um, I can talk more about this uh, and discuss it in the essay I'm planning to publish, but I think you can get some of this out of political process theory. Um, I also, uh, for, for the more historically minded, um, a lot of the framers were concerned about factionalism as a threat to civil liberty and constitutionalism. You see that in Federalist 10, uh, George Washington's farewell address, I think the jurisprudence of John Marshall in important ways. Um, so I could talk more about that, uh, but maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll just turn to a couple more um, examples, right? So if you bought this, uh, buy this argument that courts should favor symmetry, what would that actually mean in practice? What sorts of outcomes or doctrines would get a thumb on the scale from symmetry? So um, this is the point where, uh, to the extent any of you have been nodding along so far, right, people might start to head for the exits. Uh, but um, I, nonetheless, um, let me just give you a couple examples. And I talk about more in the essay. I could talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but one great illustration that's come up uh, a couple times today, and uh, in some ways the centerpiece for the essay I'm writing is the Masterpiece Cake Shop case uh, from the Supreme Court's last term. Uh, this case, uh, as you probably know, so we, uh, was discussed earlier, right, involves a, a Christian baker objects on religious grounds to same-sex marriage and therefore refuses to create a custom cake for a same-sex wedding. He gets sanctioned by state authorities for uh, violating anti-discrimination laws. Uh, but then the Supreme Court holds that uh, those penalties violated his constitutional religious freedom because uh, decision makers acted with impermissible animus towards his religion. So why is Messerby's Cake Shop a good example? So for one thing, it illustrates just the sort of conflict between competing constitutional visions that uh, I'm worried about, I'm likely, I think we're likely to see more of. Um, uh, we've got on the one hand a kind of key progressive goal of marriage equality, uh, on the other hand, um, 
uh, constitutional value of religious freedom, which uh, while in the past may have had um, more varied ideological valence, uh, tends to code as a conservative value um, today. Um, and so from that point of view, you might say, well, Masterpiece Cake Shop is kind of creating a sort of rough symmetry by offsetting the progressive win in Obergefell uh, with a kind of conservative win for traditional uh, religious freedom. But I think there's actually a, a more um, helpful implication of the, my proposal, uh, which is that in Masterpiece Cake Shop itself, right, if the, if the court was going to rule for the baker as it did, it actually had a choice between two rationales. There was a, the religious, uh, religious liberty argument that ended up carrying the day, uh, but the baker was also making a, a freedom of expression argument, saying that um, the, being compelled to produce the cake uh, by operation of the state law was, uh, was forcing, compelling him to um, express a viewpoint that he didn't share. And so in some ways, the free expression rationale would have been broader, would have been a bigger interference with um, the democratic choice reflected in the um, anti-discrimination law. But it would have the virtue of being symmetric uh, in the sense I'm talking about, because it would, that understanding would have equally protected the religious baker in this case, uh, but also by the same token, um, uh, progressive uh, bakers or other Asian creative services being asked to produce cakes or what have you with, um, with different messages. In fact, in the case itself, there were um, examples of people who asked for uh, uh, a kind of anti-gay uh, religious messages on cakes, and, uh, uh, and, and so it's not, not totally hypothetical that such cases would arise. So my point is that um, that's a, that type, that doctrinal pathway, uh, symmetry might have favored choosing that one over religious liberty precisely because it would create a ground for the decision that across the universe of cases would have a kind of bipartisan benefit rather than uh, leaning more sharply one way. Um, I could also talk more about other First Amendment cases from the last term. We talked earlier in the day about the NIFLA case uh, uh, with um, crisis pregnancy centers and the Janus case. Um, I think interestingly in both cases, the dissent uh, made a sort of version of the kind of symmetry critique I'm offering. I can talk uh, more about that. I think another example just to close with that I think uh, where this principle could be very helpful, perhaps even its most important application is with respect to the <coughs> structural constitution. So separation of powers and federalism. So uh, in principle, symmetry should be easy in those domains, right? If you, we've got a closely divided polity, uh, if you're confronting a separation of powers dispute or a federalism dispute, uh, it should be easy to imagine a kind of uh, application where the political valence is reversed uh, as a way of kind of checking intuitions. And of course, judges and, and, and law professors do this quite a lot, and it, it, it gets it why I think symmetry um, is a useful value. Uh, but it does seem to me that, particularly in public debate, um, that kind of even-handed thinking tends to get swamped by, overrun by a desire for a uh, particular substantive outcome in particular cases. So again, here I think courts should really be looking for ways to craft the doctrine that are amenable to the type of even-handed administration across different contexts that I'm striving for. And I think a great example, which actually also showed up in the courts last term, is the anti-commandeering doctrine. So this is a principle, as you probably know, uh, that the federal government can't compel state authorities to, can't require state authorities to administer and enforce uh, federal law. Uh, it, it's, in, at least in the past, has been controversial, may not be correct on the merits, there are arguments against it, but does at least have the virtue of providing equivalent protection, right, for blue states today, uh, resisting federal immigration enforcement with uh, sanctuary cities. Uh, in the future, perhaps red states resisting federal gun enforcement or under Obama, the Medicaid expansion uh, or what have you. So it has this kind of uh, symmetry across the universe of conceivable <coughs> disputes. And so I think courts should be looking for doctrinal principles with that sort of character, uh, enforcing a basic constitutional value, federalism in this case, that uh, in a way that's readily subject to even-handed application across different contexts. Okay, so um, I'll try wrap up there. I, I can ha address some other examples in the essay uh, and um, happy to talk about them. Uh, but again, just re to return to the underlying motivation for the paper, um, uh, you know, maybe this is not a persuasive proposal um, or it might not 
be an adequate reason for ruling in any one way in any particular case. It's something every individual judge would have to decide. Uh, but really my deeper goal in making this proposal is to, is to force partisans on both sides to confront um, what I might call their inner Carl Schmidt, if you know who he is. He's someone who conceptualized politics as a kind of death match between friends and enemies, uh, competing political visions, and it might be that that's just sort of the place where we are and we have to just um, fight it out, but I think that carries a very serious risk of institutional degradation. I don't find it um, particularly appealing. I think it could corrode the whole project of constitutionalism, and so, um, it, you know, I, I think we need some kind of moderating principle for constitutional law, some kind of way of critiquing decisions that don't uh, have the sort of moderating effect. And so if symmetry is the answer, I hope this will at least stimulate some further proposals along those lines. So thanks very much. So we have time for some questions. There can't be a reception for another 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> So, Jeremy, I see you're at the mic. Hi. Um, I have regarding... Maybe that's not on yet. Hello? Oh, there we go. I had a question about um, Professor Price, your symmetry proposal. Um, so, my concern with it is that it creates false equivalencies between factions. I mean, um, in the last panel, I mean, Professor Littman talked about how calling someone a racist or a sexist is seen as worse than actual racism and actual sexism. And Professor Robinson also talked about how neutrality can be a mask for, like, or is like, neutrality is an illusion that masks like the injustices of caste systems. So how would you respond to those criticisms? Sure, yeah, so that's an important objection, right? So, so and first of all, the, you know, the Constitution is not gonna be neutral with respect to all points of view. I mean, it's part of the point is to resolve certain questions, uh, you know, on a basic level, it's certainly not neutral between white supremacy and, and racial equality, for example. Um, but, and so that's where the principle is not always gonna be decisive or um, controlling, and people are gonna have to sort out when it can have effect and when it can't. Um, but it is partly just a kind of empirical conjecture about the political dynamics that surround constitutional law. And I think it's, it, so, you know, I, I guess the way I'm trying to envision the analysis is the fact is that we do have a closely divided polity and when everyone has views about which side is correct but um, one has to, I think judges might need to be conscious about how the decisions they're making uh, are gonna function within that environment. Uh, um, and, and even if that doesn't mean they're always gonna, it's gonna override whatever more primary commitments they would have. And I guess the most basic aspect of the, the proposal is partly just a matter of judicial rhetoric, that when courts are justifying decisions, uh, often the impulse is to be minimal, to say no more than necessary, but sometimes articulating a broader rationale uh, could be beneficial in the sense it points out that um, someone, it, it might help, def a broader rationale could sometimes diffuse political controversy around a case if it highlights the fact that coming out a certain way in one context uh, will have benefits for, for the um, uh, differing political coalition in, in the future. So it's a really important question for which I don't have a complete answer, but precisely what I'm striving for is a principle that people who view primary questions very differently could equally uh, incorporate. And I think that's ultimately the only such solution that will work has to have that character. Hopefully this is an easy, quick question. Come closer to the microphone there. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Um, I'm just wondering, as a panel of a judge and three former clerks, maybe you have some insight on this. Um, how much do judges and justices think about their own legacies? And assuming Kennedy thought about his, is that think something their that- own, Their own, their own legacies. Legacy. legacy. And assuming Kennedy thought about his own legacy, is that something that we could see manifest in his actions or is that something that you think about but don't do anything about? I think that Supreme Court judges, justices do. Um, for my part, and I think for my colleagues, 
we're so busy, we're not thinking about our legacy. We're thinking about <laughs> what we're doing every day. But there, there is something about, as um, Dan was saying, being one of nine in the Supreme Court and having all eyes upon you, that does seem to lead to some larger vision of one's role. And I, I, for example, um, when I clerked for Justice Brennan, he had all the law clerks um, write these histories of every case that he worked on <coughs> and that we worked on um, and put them away and then gave access to a biographer and chose a um, sort of authorized biographer who then didn't write the biography for 15 years, but that's another story. Um, and certainly had some sense of his own role and importance. I would say that appellate judges um, are somewhat less likely to be thinking about how they're viewed rather than what they're doing. Let me say one thing about the legacy uh, point with Justice Brennan. Uh, this is, I happened to be clerking for him the year that he decided to give these histories, which he had his law clerks write every June and July to Steve Vermeil, who then uh, 15 years later finally produced the biography. Um, up until that year, which was 1984-85, Justice Brennan had his law clerks prepare the histories, but then he would say, I'm going to have them destroyed when I leave. Because I can recall having to sit with him, we all sat with him and had a big discussion about, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't destroy them, you shouldn't, you should let, they're great value to history, et cetera, et cetera. And it always, I always wondered, why did he have people do it? If he, so I think he was ambivalent actually. I never heard that. Yeah. Because well, it didn't make a lot of sense. I always thought he was saving it for posterity. Well, I think he must have been, because why would he have you do it? But anyway, um, so I think, I, but who doesn't think about their legacy, right? I mean, you, even if you're not a judge. <laughs> well, it's spent between my legacy. I mean, it is. <laughs> so then if that's like true. Have nice grandchildren, but. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's true, can you think of an example of, you know, evidence that Kennedy was thinking about his and his actions or any of his decisions? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll say he's, he certainly would never say to us uh, while we were clerks, um, well, we should decide this way because I'm concerned about my legacy. And so, I mean, I, I think that it's hard to believe justices in general are not aware of these concerns. They're not in the background. And, um, you know, it's also going to be kind of hard to separate from the merits. It may be the case that, that the, the sort of gay rights decisions um, you know, somebody like Justice Kennedy is sort of looking at wondering, you know, what is history going to think of this 100 years from now? But that, is that a legacy question or is that a question about what the right answer is? And maybe, you know, something that seems like the right answer today might look like the, right an the wrong answer 100 years from now. Yeah, I mean, I think that it certainly is something they care about, but how it, what it means beyond just trying to get every case right and, and justify it as best they can. I mean, with Kennedy, I think um, Professor Kerr's observations earlier in the day about kind of why he sometimes goes into this kind of non-legal register um, it was quite perceptive. I think it, it you know, one of the things that um, lawyers tend to uh, kind of not like about his opinions are, I think really, I think that's true that they're kind of pitched at, a, at the broader public and maybe aimed at that kind of, the kind of legacy. So that might be a concrete way in which Kennedy took that into account. Um, but you know, I, I sure. do think, I mean, there, there is a obvious change in writing styles over time. Uh, when I was reading Justice Kennedy's Ninth Circuit opinions from the 70s and 80s, literally the footnotes were longer than the text, uh, and they were certainly not designed for public consumption. Uh, there is clearly a, a move right now, uh, and you can see it on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Kagan and Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch among others, uh, of writing in a more colloquial style. On my court, Justice uh, Judge Kaczynski did this uh, in, in spades. Um, and the, and, and at least some of the impetus behind this is some sense of communicating with a larger public, whether that's, a, whether you call that a legacy interest, 
I don't know, but there is a sense of the fact that the court is a public institution. Because uh, for myself, I believe somewhere in the middle, i.e. we should write formally but not um, inscrutably. Um, but if you read opinions from the 70s and 80s, they can be inscrutable. On, uh, and Judge, Judge Kennedy's opinions from the late 70s and early 80s were definitely in that variety. It's a, it's a good question, and let me just say that um, it, it, we, we become law professors or lawyers and say, well, what do you mean actually by legacy? Um, depends what is means. Um, there isn't any doubt in my mind that Justice Kennedy, unlike, I'm sorry, like other justices, cared a lot about consistency over time. He did not want to be called the swing justice. He, do, he doesn't agree with the swing justice. He says the cases swing, I don't. Um, you know, his Eighth Amendment jurisprudence in the death penalty area, his same-sex marriage case, I mean, he is clearly concerned with a consistency and even a further development of the same line of thinking, um, even as he writes limitations into certain parts of the opinions. Um, is that a concern with legacy, or is that just a concern with consistency or, or you know, being known as the justice who did X? Justice Brennan dissented, uh, you know, in death penalty cases with Justice Marshall. I mean, one could be more charitable yeah. saying it's concerned with getting uh, the, the with the fact that if you believe something, you believe it, and therefore it should you could should continue uh, to try to achieve it, right. Right. not because you're trying to deal with appearances, because you're trying to deal with substance. Yeah, I agree with that. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you all. Uh, this question is for everyone, although it's uh, kind of inspired by uh, Professor Price's ideas about symmetry. Um, while Justice Kennedy didn't like to be called the swing vote, I think his popular understanding as a relatively moderate uh, justice helped give the court legitimacy and people saw it not just as a strict continuance of the political infighting that happened in the other branches, but it was something a little bit beyond politics. Uh, now Justice Kennedy is gone and Justice Kavanaugh is, is on the court and there is a kind of solid five to four conservative uh, court. Uh, do you foresee, in order to avoid the sort of interior or uh, institutional decay uh, that Professor Price has talked about, do you foresee some of the institutionalists on the court, maybe Professor or uh, Judge Roberts or, or Justice Kagan, um, adopting something that looks kind of like symmetry or, or, or something to that effect in order to preserve that uh, institutional legitimacy? Can, can I, I want to resist right away the idea that we know how Justice Kavanaugh is going to vote on every case. I really want to resist that. Um, I looked at his criminal cases on the D.C. Circuit, criminal cases. He wrote one of the most liberal opinions you can imagine, uh, defending the right of a defendant to put on a battered uh, spouse syndrome defense. Um, he wrote it with Harry Edwards, the most liberal member, let's say, of that court. And there was a dissent filed by, I can't remember, Silberman or somebody. Um, I don't think you can project, you know, it's too early. Uh, certain things, obviously. Um, but other thing, and, and somebody said, maybe it was Judge, Ber I can't remember, Judge Berzon, th they don't know what they're going to be facing 10 years from now, really. I mean, give the guy a chance to write a few controversial opinions and not just nine O's. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, to, to answer the question directly, I'm optimistic that the justices will all read my essay and take my advice, <laughs> and the Republic will be saved. But if, if I can comment a little on, on the symmetry notion, two things strike me. One is that as I understand it, it is really a prescription about how to write opinions after you've decided how they're going to come out. Um, is, that, is that right? And, yeah. I mean, and that assumes two things. One, that you've decided how it's going to come out before you think through the, the, the doctrine, which I don't think is necessarily the case. At least I always resist. I, I tell my students here that that's not how I decide cases. I don't go to the bottom line and then, then circle back to the, to the reasoning. Um, and second of all, um, it, it's, oh, I think, somewhat Pollyanna-ish, given the fact that the people who are being chosen as judges, arguably, are not of that mind. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, two things. I mean, I think it's not just a point about rationale, but also about doctrinal design. I mean, you, you know, the, you could implement the free expression value in various ways, but the, the content neutrality rule, one of its virtues is the, the symmetry. I think likewise, you know, federalism, you know, the, in earlier periods, the court tried to identify essential functions and the stuff that is much more 
mushy, and I think using the, something like the anti-commandeering doctrine uh, is a way of designing, implementing that value in a way that's symmetric and that's a point in its favor. So um, it, it does have some purchase at that, at that, not just at the level of justification, but in terms of um, doctrinal choices that um, particularly at the Supreme Court level inform um, not just the result you're reaching in the particular case, but across a broader set of cases. I mean, it does have the, you know, this, this proposal does have a problem that um, many such proposals have that it kind of um, assumes the state of the world and then proposes a, a solution contrary to that state of the world. I mean, that's what you're getting at, right? If we have a selection process oriented towards putting highly, you know, ideological people on, on courts, then um, in principle this might not appeal to them. I, I, part of the reason I think this proposal has some attraction is that I nonetheless think that judges do feel a real pull for, they want to be, have a kind of logical consistency. They don't want to be seen as just result-driven partisans, right? They want to be understood as, as a kind of forum of principle and, um, you know, what principles they adopt may ha have a kind of relate to background political commitments, but I think this, I this idea could have some kind of pull for, for judges and justices um, because of the kind of role morality of their position. And I do think um, some Roberts opinions, you know, as was mentioned, reflect this kind of impulse. You might think of NFIB, the kind of perplexing choice to reach both the Commerce Clause and the tax power and then also um, rule the way it did on the anti-commandeering point reflects a kind of effort to spread around wins and losses in a way that might, might kind of try and placate everyone. It may have just inflamed everyone, but I actually don't think so. I think it, I think it actually did, I mean, I think conservatives were quite upset about that result, and, and, or at least some of them, but, but they, I think it, probably having the Commerce Clause holding upset the, or, or offset the disappointment to some degree. Um, um, so, I don't know. I'm gonna exercise the prerogative of the moderator and say let's continue our discussions at, at a reception. Let me just tell you a few things before we leave. First, thank you for staying. The audience deserves a hand together with the panelists, so let's do that.